This was the diet which bred that hearty race of mortals who won the fields of Cressy and Agincourt. The renowned King Arthur is generally looked upon as the first who ever sat down to a whole roasted ox, which was certainly the best way to preserve the gravy. And it is further added that he and his knights sat about it at his round table and usually consumed it to the very bones before they would enter on any debate of moment. The Black Prince was a professed lover of the brisket, not to mention the history of the sirloin or the institution of the Order of Beef Eaters, which are all so many evident and undeniable marks of the great respect which our warlike predecessors have paid to this excellent food. The tables of the ancient gentry of this nation were covered thrice a day with hot roast beef. And I am credibly informed by an antiquary who has searched the registers in which the bills of fare of the court are recorded, that instead of tea and bread and butter, which have prevailed of late years, the maids of honour in Queen Elizabeth's time were allowed three rumps of beef for their breakfast. Now that, Dominic, as you will well know, because you sent that quote to me, was Joseph Addison writing in the Tatler in 1710 about roast beef. Yes. And today we are looking at England, <laughs> our, our own native land. Um, and you have chosen as your theme, this great theme of roast beef and the role that it's played in notions of liberty and distinctiveness and John Bull and all that kind <laughs> of stuff. Yes. Well, England, Tom, uh, I mean, so much to choose from because, of course, we are both English. But I thought, why not choose one of the most English things of all, which is roast beef or indeed beef and liberty. That's the theme of um, of today's podcast. Now, of course, for you, this is slightly – it's ambiguous ground, isn't it? Because while I'm sure you would style yourself a very patriotic Englishman, you are not, as fair to say, one of life's great beef eaters. No, not really. Uh, as in not at all. Yeah, not at all. No. Well – I mean, listeners can draw their own conclusions but, about the Dominic, patriotism or otherwise of Tom Holland. Well, but I love liberty. You love liberty. So beef and liberty, that, that's the slogan that's stamped on the buttons of the waistcoat of the members of the Beefsteak Club. It is, is indeed, right? and we should be coming to the Beefsteak Club. So, you know, roast beef, today, roast beef, I suppose, competes with fish and chips, doesn't it? And chicken tikka and masala as yeah, one of the great dish. sort of... You know, emblematic national dishes. We probably eat less beef per capita than at any time, I would guess, for centuries, wouldn't you say? Because there's so much suspicion mm. of red meat now for health reasons and and all this sort of stuff. And also, of course, mad cow disease, I'm sure, yeah, delivered it absolutely. quite a fatal blow. I think, it, I think it did deliver it a blow. But the idea of the English as beef eating, so the French, of course, call us les roses beef. So it's not purely our self-image, it's also the way we are perceived. As we call them grand oui. Yeah as we call frogs. them, frogs. And yeah. we should be coming to frogs and the contrast between frogs and roast beef in a second. But the association between the, the English in particular and beef is an old one. So in Shakespeare's Henry V, which I think is commonly agreed to have been written in 1599, there's a scene just before the Battle of Agincourt and the French are talking. You know, they're the constable of France and various other sort of knights and commanders are talking. And one Frenchman says, that island of England breeds very valiant creatures. Their mastiffs are of unmatchable courage. And the constable of France says, the men do sympathize with the mastiffs in robustious and rough coming on, leaving their wits with their wives, and then give them great meals of beef and iron and steel. They will eat like wolves and fight like devils. So even there, at the end of the 16th century, you have a hint of some themes that will become very familiar in this episode. So the association of the English with beef and with mastiffs or bulldogs and with bulls and with fighting like animals and with this sort of, this sort of primitive um, animal spirits and lack of sophistication. Now, this, of course, is, is Shakespeare talking. It's not the French talking. And why would beef seem to matter? Well, an obvious reason, Tom, even though you don't eat beef, is that in Tudor England, a lot of people did. So obviously, people let beef all over Europe. But I think it's pretty fair to say that the Tudors eat more meat than their neighbours do. Tudor English men and women. And why is that? Well, so there's a brilliant book on this, which I should have flagged up already, actually, but called uh, Beef and Liberty by a chap called Ben Rogers. It was published about 20 years ago. An absolutely wonderful um, journey through this topic from which I have stolen mercilessly 
ballads <laughs> and poems and so on. And he but it's says, speaking to you, isn't it? Because, it's speaking because to me. the it's, image it's, is, well, I suppose John Bull. Well, we'll come to John Bull. Because John Bull is literally, I mean, he, he begins as a bull, doesn't he? Well, I'm not sure whether he does. There, there is an association between the English and bulls. I think John Bull, well, we'll come to John Bull. I shall, with his okay, waistcoat I, and, yes, his, okay, and his, I'm sorry, and I, his, his pewter tankard and all this but, sort of But it's stuff. the embodiment of non-metropolitan, yeah. uh, solid, the solid sense of the, the English gentleman, country gentleman, his yes. waistcoat straining as he <laughs> Thanks, devours Tom. yet another haunch <laughs> of beef. Yeah, that's pretty much... I Solid mean, common sense. Exactly. Absolutely right. Um, outraged of Chipping Norton. I think it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fair well, to say. Not even outraged, perhaps. I mean, No, uh, uh, no uh, it's I phlegmatic of Chipping Norton. Phlegmatic, Chipping yeah. Phlegmatic. I mean, you know, hysterical <laughs> overreaction. That's the kind of thing that Frenchmen exactly. and Londoners get up exactly. to. Exactly. That enthusiasm of all kinds, I think, yes. Tom, is the, is the enemy. Yes. Um, Epicene... <laughs> Right. Do you know, I've got some great quotes coming coming about Londoners and their metropolitan great. foppish ways, which you'll be delighted by. Excellent. Uh, so Ben Rogers, in his book, he says there are obvious reasons why um, people would eat more beef. As we've talked about many times, going back to our Anglo-Saxon podcasts, England is very rich in farmland um, compared with a lot of European countries. You know, it's got it's got lots of lowlands, green verdant lowlands. It's perfect for dairy farming. It is producing a lot of kind of milk and butter and beef um, over the course of the 16th century, although there are general price rises, so it's a time of great inflation then as now, uh, the price of beef falls um, relative to other products. So beef is much more readily available. And the one, one way we can tell how much people ate and how distinctive this was is from travelers' stories. So first of all, English travelers who go abroad. So... Ben Rogers gives a brilliant example of a chap called Sir Richard Morrison, who goes to Venice in the 1570s, and he says he is astounded by the food, and he says there is more meat eaten in two months in London than an entire year in Venice. He's so he's he's struck. Well, not many cows in Venice. <laughs> not many cows, exactly. <laughs> but also there are other. So there's another. There's an Italian traveller called Alessandro Magno, who comes to London at about the same time, and he writes in Italian. Uh, I assume it's extraordinary to see the great quantity and quality of meat, beef and mutton that comes every day from the slaughterhouses in the city. The beef is not expensive and they roast it whole in large pieces. For those who cannot see it, it's almost impossible be to believe that they could eat so much meat in one city alone. And uh, as time goes on, I think over the next, let's say, 150 years, beef becomes steadily cheaper relative to other meats, partly because of enclosures. So farmland is becoming much more productive. So there's just more meat, more butter, more of this sort of stuff being produced. And also there's the uh, agrarian revolution. Exactly, the agrarian revolution. Yeah, yeah so, town's end and all that So there's just stuff. a sort of sense that, um, you know, there's just more of it and probably better quality. And, and travellers from abroad remark on it more and more as time goes on. So in 1698, a Frenchman called Henri Misson, he says at that point, 16, as early as 1698, it is common practice to have a huge piece of roast beef on Sundays of which people stuff until they can swallow no more, and they eat the rest cold the other six days of the week. Now, of course, he could have been writing that in the as late as the 1950s, mm. um, but he's writing that in the 1690s. Is there a kind of an association on the part of foreign observers between the eating of beef and the sense of the English as simultaneously violent and phlegmatic? I th <laughs> which... Which yeah, seems to yeah, be a kind of an abiding theme. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, I don't think they make a direct association, but it's absolutely right that the same travellers will be making those points. So you're absolutely right that the English are perceived as being very violent, disputatious, and yet similar, and yet at the same time ponderous, gruff, and stoical, and yeah. and all these like, sort of like things. Bulls. Or oxen, perhaps. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So you can sort of see why people would make that. The sort of red bloodedness, as you, if you and like, and the 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 converse is that presumably when the English go say to France mm -hmm. and they see them all eating frogs and vegetables and onions they think it's and very things, poor. yeah, they think, they think it's, it's very rubbish. poor. And I suppose the archetype of that is William Hogarth's painting. Well, we should come to Hogarth. He will play a key okay, part. Sorry, so I'm jumping the gun again. That's fine, Tom. It's good to uh, it's good to anticipate. Lighting it up. Okay. So the English are definitely eating an awful lot of beef. Ben Rogers calls us the Texans. 
of the early modern world. I like and that. And I think that's a, a that's an I, for our Texan listeners, that's a comparison <laughs> I welcome. Um, if it's associated with any one class in particular, he thinks it's associated with yeoman. So yeoman farmers. Okay, so, so not the gentry. Will, well, the gentry will eat beef, and in fact, French. Some of these travellers do remark on this. A Swiss traveller in 1726 called Monsieur Mural, he says, they'll eat roast beef as well at a king's table as at a tradesman's. So there's actually an odd sense in which the, ro- the eating of roast beef is, is it democratic? That's probably the wrong word, but it's universal. But also an index of wealth, presumably. Yes, although it's not that expensive. Again, it's n- the point is it's not that expensive. So if you're eating stuffed quails or something, then you're, you're rich. But presumably it's quite expensive on the continent relative to the expense of, yes. in England. yes. Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. I think it's because England has still this farmland or whatever. I'm not a massive agrarian specialist, (laughs) it's fair to say, Tom. Um, It's up there with my knowledge of Portuguese sailing technology. Uh, But because we have all this, beef is readily available. Slaughterhouses pumping out all this stuff if if slaughterhouses can. I mean, the stuff they're pumping out, actually, I don't even want to think about. I think that's sausage uh, factories. Yeah, exactly. Food manufacturers. But it's associated with yeoman farmers. And, of course, the yeoman of the guard are known as beef eaters. Of course they are, yes. And, um, and how long does that go back? How far does that go back? Well, I think that, that goes back centuries, actually. There are various explanations about why they're called beef eaters, but Rogers points out that right up to the 19th century, if you're a yeoman of the guard, you are given a ration of beef every day. So if you're a yeoman of the guard at St. James's Palace, you are still being given 24 pounds of beef a day, wow. which is an, a lot of beef. Yeah, it is. Now, here's a key thing. How do people cook it? You might think this is a bit abstruse, but actually this com- comes back to this point about liberty and we'll get to it. Well, I'll explain why. Not with garlic. Right. If you're in Italy or in France, the way they have their meat in the early modern period is they will often fry it or braise it or stew it. The English like to roast it. And what they, now the, I didn't know this actually. This is a, I find this fascinating. The word roast and rotate of course, have yes. the same kind of derivation. Roti. So they're basically the same word. And the way you would roast it, you've got an open fire, you put it on a spit, and you rotate it initially by hand. But over time, I mean, that's very time consuming and boring. Yeah, and you need a scullion. What if you don't have a scullion? You get a dog to do it, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get a dog to do it? So they basically trap a dog on a treadmill, oh, God. and the dog revolves the spit. Wow, beef or liberty. Yeah. No well, liberty, liberty for, for dogs. No, no liberty for the dogs. Um, but over time, they develop these things called meat jacks, which are mechanical, and they have weights. Um, how do they work, Dominic? Uh, it's a complicated system of weights, Tom. <laughs> I know you, you wouldn't understand. Um, weights going up and down and the thing rotating. I think that's a technical ex- explanation. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. Uh, so by the uh, – Dr. Johnson, I think, grew up in a home in Litchfield with a, with a meat jack. He talks about meat would. jack. Dr. Johnson is the physical embodiment of a beef eater. So Finnish writer called Pear Calm, he visited in the late 18th century, and he said they have meat jacks in every house in England, which was clearly an exaggeration, but maybe they had them in every house he visited. I mean, that's perfectly plausible. So roasting meat is absolutely part of the sort of national it, – it's, it's, it's a national custom, I suppose you can say. So how do you eat it? So you've roasted it. You have it in its own juices. You have it in well, – what that's its gravy. You do not have it with a, a fancy stock or a sauce, which is why Voltaire said the English have a hundred different religions, but only one sauce. Mm-hmm. And this is the sauce, you see. So you don't have any fancy sauce. You have it with this gravy. You have it with condiments. So traditionally, English mustard, I don't really know why, possibly, I guess, lack of lack of access to spices, but English mustard had always been stronger than continental. So well, surely that reflects our love of liberty. <laughs> Maybe. We're just strong people, Tom. Yeah, there's just no um, Frenchified nonsense about so our mustard. They, in England, mustard was mixed with horseradish to make it stronger, and horseradish itself was mixed with vinegar. In France, they mixed it with cream, which um, <laughs> made it more <laughs> mellow, mild. Typical. But in England, people mixed it with vinegar. So these continental travellers who were tucking into their beef are kind of, <laughs> you know, yes, exactly, <laughs> sort of sobbing with agony as they eat their horseradish and mustard. The other thing you would have it with, Tom, are you a big believer in puddings? I am, yes. What kind as of puddings? my father. What kind of puddings do you like? We never go out for a meal. And yeah. he will always say, is there uh, any <laughs> pud? And there always is. 
But he would eat that after his main course, am I right? Yes, he would, yes. Well, you see, if you were in the 18th century, that would be very strange and outlandish behavior. Oh, you would well. eat your pudding alongside, and it would be a pudding. Yes, So of made course. of suet or something, yeah. or conceivably a pie. Um, and so originally, yeah, we in England, we, I know we have lots of Australian and American listeners who probably find it weird, our terminology for um, what they would call desserts, that we call them puddings, even when they're not a pudding. Originally, a pudding was a, was a kind of cousin of the sausage. Mm. So it was like a sort of so skin. steak and kidney pudding. Exactly. Ben Rogers says the closest you can come to a, a pudding is actually eating haggis. Haggis is basically mm. a pudding. So a skin stuffed with, with stuff. And interestingly, at this point, so early modern England, people didn't um, distinguish between sweet and savory. And they'd shove the That's two in together. And that is so sweet meats. Well, this is, explains to me something that has always puzzled me, which is if I say to you, would you like a mince pie? Yeah, it's a, it it's could a, mean it's the sweet one or right. a, yes. a pudding with mince in it. Go mince and buy meat. me some mince meat, Tom. Yeah. What would yeah. you come back with? Will you bring come back with minced meat or mince meat, which yeah. is completely different and is sweet? So Christmas pudding is a kind of the last remnant, one of the yeah. last remnants of this world. It's a plum pudding. But they, people would have had puddings where they'd have shoved all kinds of stuff I mean, in them. I mean, this is an astonishing diet then. So you're yeah. having your roast beef and then you're having a meat pudding at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no wonder we're rushing around conquering the world exactly. with all that amount of meat. So, And you're washing this down, not with um, French wines, but with ale or porter or fortified port, wine yeah. port. Yeah. You know, from Portugal. From our so, oldest ally. So it's fair to say it's quite heavy. <laughs> it's yeah. quite a heavy diet. Yeah. I mean, um, gout must be... A constant yeah. risk. Well, this is, I mean, who was it? Who was a three bottle man? Was it William Pitt the Younger? Yeah. We were talking about yeah. in our Prime Minister's podcast. So, three bottles, puddings, beef. <laughs> I mean, it's a great diet. It's amazing yeah. that people live beyond the age of 40. And again, am I, I, I hope I'm not jumping the gun. There's a the famous Gilray cartoon, isn't there? Of a, a weedy, thin Frenchman gnawing on an onion. Exactly. And yes. A, a massively fat Englishman with gout and bright red nose yeah slop with <laughs> tucking into an entire roast haunch of roast beef and gravy dribbling down his waistcoat that's exactly right tom and you're not jumping the gun at all so the, what the french are doing is really important in this story hence the beef and liberty so the french cooking is very different so what's happened by the 18th century is that french cooking has evolved from the court it's very top down and as you would expect in a kind of absolutist court sophistication and order rather than simplicity, is the, as the sort of watchword. And so by the 18th century, you have the birth of something called, would you believe, nouvelle cuisine. So this is where the expression nouvelle cuisine comes from. The nouvelle cuisine of the 70s and 80s, kind of tiny portions, is merely the latest iteration of this. So it's the French who divide sweet and savory into different courses, which we wouldn't have done in Britain. Uh, the, it's the French who say vegetables are actually worthwhile. And you could um, mm. you can cook them and fry them up or whatever, or put them in a sauce. It's also the French who have soups rather than broths, and the French who have. So, what's the difference between a soup and a broth? Well, a soup will be creamy and based on a stock. It'll be okay. smooth and creamy, okay. and there'll be lots of stock. Basically, the, it's not like a broth where you just shove a load of stuff into some water and let it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and crucially, they will serve their meat very differently. So they will stuff it. They will often stew it in stock. And then they'll serve it with a special rich sauce. And this is why if you go through 18th century English culture, novels and whatnot, you will see all the time the dreaded words ragu and fricassee, yes. which are regarded with absolute <laughs> scorn contempt. and contempt. <laughs> yeah. So French cookbooks of the 18th century will say, here's a recipe for a lovely ragu. Um, <laughs> this is very much a la mode. So funnily enough, even though we think of French cooking now as very conservative, in the 18th century, of course, it's very yeah. forward looking. English cookbooks at the same time will say, there's nothing fashionable in this book. This is traditional, old-fashioned. Unless, unless it's being, you know, at Holland House and similar Whiggish strongholds. Tom, have you been secretly reading up on this? No. but These I, are great insights. These are yeah, very good you. insights. Thank it you. is worth doing this podcast with you. You do. You have great <laughs> historical instincts. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I may not know where Uruguay is, but. Yes, exactly. Well, as we I know what they ate at Holland House. Exactly. The aptly named Holland House where people are eating metropolitan fancy <laughs> foods. So, um, yeah. so yes, the, the key thing is that the French have their way, the English have theirs, but the French way is making great inroads. 
in yeah. the course of the 18th century. So in 1747, a guy called Robert Campbell writes a book called The London Tradesman, advising people about apprenticeships. And in the course of this, he goes off on a massive rant in which he says, um, in the days of good Queen Elizabeth, you know, so harking back as as in that quotation from the Tatler at the beginning that you started with, to this idea, this fantasy that under good Queen Bess, you know, Protestant England, everybody ate beef mm -hmm. six times a day or whatever. He says, in the days of good Queen Elizabeth, when mighty roast beef was the Englishman's food, our cookery was plain as plain and simple as our manners. It was not then a science or mystery and required no conjuration. But he says, we have of late years refined ourselves out of that simple taste and conformed our palates to meats and drinks dressed after the French fashion. The natural taste of fish or flesh has become nauseous to our fashionable stomach. We abhor that anything should appear at our tables in its native properties. He says all this new frangled French food is dressed in masquerade, seasoned with slow poisons, and every dish pregnant with nothing. Sounds quite Daily Mail. If, well, I was going to say, it's like one of Giles Corrin's um, Sunday Times restaurant reviews. <laughs> yes. I'd like him to end one of his reviews if he's listening. Uh, every dish was pregnant with nothing. Um, but why is he having this rant? Well, it is precisely as you say, because people at the aptly named Holland House mm. are eating a lot of French food. So Ramona's. <laughs> right. In the course of the 18th century, there is a kind of transformation of, of manners. You know, we really should do more podcasts about the 18th century. We're going to, a, aren't we? In the it's year. such an interesting time. We're going to. So people are adopting, you know, china and glassware and cotton and tea and coffee and all these things. And there's this kind of Europe, this perceived Europeanization of English customs. And this has a, a, a distinct political meaning because, as you said, it's associated with the Whig grandees, with Robert Walpole, and in particular with the Pelham family who basically succeed him and dominate British politics in the 1740s and 1750s, uh, Thomas and Henry Pelham. So Thomas Pelham, who's the Duke of Newcastle, he's our fourth prime minister, colossally, unbelievably rich, and, and associated with this sort of Whig world of, of all these mercantile links and travel and diplomacy and sort of sense of cosmopolitanism, I suppose. But also not necessarily sound on the fundamentals of British liberty. Is that right? I think there's a slight perception that the Whigs are about... I mean, the, the categories are so slippery in the mid-18th century. I mean, they've changed from what they were in the early 18th century. But I think there's a sort of sense that they of corruption, um, of having lost touch with this kind of broad base of the country and the common but by man. The, by the time of um, the heyday of Holland House in the uh, backdrop of the French Revolution, mm -hmm. yeah, but dodgy, they would basically welcome, they'd welcome Jacobin. They are citizens of the world. To set up a guillotine Tom. in Trafalgar Square and yeah. all that kind of yeah. stuff. I don't know whether that's true earlier on, but definitely they're associated with the Tories, will associate them with greed and corruption, with luxury. And with the city. Yeah, with the city, with continentalism. Um, and the city is interesting you say that. So in his book, Ben Rogers says, basically, it sometimes seems like the 18th century is one long moral panic, um, one long sort of howl, even though England is actually doing so well in the 18th century, the one long howl of hysteria about foreign ways. So there's a preacher, he's got a lovely quote from um, um, John Brown, who attacks what he calls the town effeminacy of, uh, of London. And Rogers says, to most rural gentlemen, that's me, the capital was a malignant growth a place where courtiers and placemen, pimps and fops, That's pastry me. cooks and hairdressers <laughs> united to drain the country of its wealth. And I did think of you, Tom, because he said well, the key figure in the Tory imagination of the mid-18th century is the aristocratic fop or beau, a snobbish, <laughs> mincing thing, as smooth and rich as a French pâté. <laughs> Yeah, well, whenever I see a French pate, Tom, I think of you. <laughs> um, so cookery becomes this terrific battleground. and. Um, you did the quote from the Tatler. That's 1710. So that's it's happening quite early on, and it runs all the way through the 18th century. And just to kind of close this half of the podcast, um, you see this in cookbooks, and the most famous cookbook of the 18th century is Hannah Glass's cookbook, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, which was published in 1747. We, t I think we talked about this a little bit in the podcast we did right at the beginning of the rest of history with Penn Vogler. Do you remember that Tom? We I did do, all yes, that history yes. of food. Yeah, and. Um, Hannah Glass's book is published, it's only just a couple of years after the 45. So the French had behaved very badly in the 45, kind of tacitly supporting Bonnie, Prince Charlie and whatnot. 
it's also, I think, the War of the Austrian Succession has started. So we're fighting the French. I mean, we're basically always fighting the French, aren't we, in the 18th yeah. century? Um, and Hannah Glass says in this book, I mean, the title itself tells you, made cookery made plain and easy. That, that speaks of this ethos. She says, don't use French sources. Don't copy French food. Um, it's too rich. It's too expensive. It's bad for you. It's unpatriotic, all this sort of stuff. But she knows that Frenchness is kind of seeping into the country because she says, so much is the blind folly of this age that they would rather be imposed upon by a French booby than give encouragement to a good English cook. Well, I think that's a very stirring and patriotic note on which to end our first course, which has consisted of beef. Uh, if you come back for the second half, we'll find out what's what's being served up in the second course. That's I it. I'll give you a clue. It, I suspect yeah. it may be beef. Let's <laughs> see you in a sec for more beef. Hello, welcome back to the second course of our serving of roast beef. And as promised, Dominic... <laughs> Have you got more beef for us? I have, it's nothing but beef. People, right. There's an American phrase, isn't there? Where's the beef? Uh, um, it's here. It's here. <laughs> That's exactly where it is. So um, so what turns this into a kind of national crusade? What, where does beef and liberty come from? Well, Tom, I know that we have one or two actors who listen to this podcast. For example, the actor Samuel West sometimes contacts us on Twitter. I think it's fair to say he's not a man who's likely to address a benefit of the, of the young conservatives. And that's true, Tom. But he, he plays uh, vets, doesn't he? Does he? Yes. So he'd be very much all over beef. Uh, he'd, well, he'd have his hand up. <laughs> he would. <laughs> anyway, listen. Surprisingly, the heroes of this story, the champions of patriotic cookery, are actors and artists. So very much um, not the people you would think of to be standing against the, uh, the sophistication of the continent. Brian Blessed, you could imagine. Yeah. He'd, he'd beef. <laughs> Was that how Brown Blessed would do it? This is. Yes. Yeah, I think, <laughs> so I think you've lost all our international audience. Oh, they've seen Flash Gordon. Yes, Gordon's well, alive. Yeah. Beef. That's how he talks. Anyway, <laughs> okay. brilliant. This Sorry. is top historical analysis. <laughs> so actors have been very concerned about foreign influence all through the 18th century because something terrible has happened in 1710. Do you know what that is, Dom? Uh, no. It's the arrival of opera. Oh, God. Yes. So The Spectator and The Tatler, these two landmark journals, which have been founded by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele, I think it is, which were great sort of advocates of beef. They had been campaigning very vigorously against the opera. They had demanded a return to manly entertainments. So what is a manly entertainment? Um, an old-fashioned English like play. Torturing bulls? No. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Killing dogs? Cockfighting? <laughs> Killing rat? Ratting? <laughs> Who, <laughs> Who needs opera? You, you wouldn't see that on the stage, though, would you? You well, wouldn't watch a rat being no. tortured on, <laughs> on the stage. No, probably not. I'm going to campaign for that in the in my column. <laughs> the arts column. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bring back cockfighting. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, That'll go down well with Middle England. Anyway, listen, uh, Jonathan Swift was also an opponent of opera. Do you know what he said about it, Tom? What did he say? He said it was wholly unsuitable to our northern climate. <laughs> Why? <laughs> he said it was unnatural. Would you oh. believe? <laughs> but it's not natural, is it? It's not natural. I mean, it, no one could claim it's natural. But that's the point. Well, I know that's the point. Anyway. That's the whole genius of it. There was a great movement in the theatre to resist this. And we, a year ago, um, did a podcast about Anglo-Italian relations. We were talking about yeah, macaronis. We yes, we did. And the resistance to macaronis. And this is actually part of that whole spectrum. So the idea of sort of foreign cookery, foreign music, foreign fashion, all being wrapped up together in a great ragu. Yeah. Um, so uh, the real person who, it, who sort of drives this is a, a great friend of the rest is history. It is top um, investigator, novelist. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Ghost hunter. And ghost hunter, Henry Fielding. Um, so Henry Fielding writes an attack on Walpole in the 1730s called the, Grog the Grub Street Opera. Important to stress, it's not really an opera. It's more a musical, an old-fashioned, good, good traditional English musical. And he has a cook who sings a song in the musical. She says she hates um, French ways and French politeness. 
and she sings this song, which I shall, I shall not sing, but I shall read it to you. When mighty roast beef was the Englishman's food, it ennobled our veins and enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were good. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. But since we have learnt from all vaporing France to eat their ragouts as well as to dance, oh, what a fine figure we make in romance. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. Then Britons from all nice dainties refrain, which effeminate Italy, France and Spain, and mighty roast beef shall command on the main. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. It would so have been lovely. If I'd sung that it. being sung by the, on the terraces, wouldn't it? It would. I'd love In to see Qatar. that. So, well, well, if you are interested, so that was turned. That that play was actually never performed. It was suppressed. But Fielding later reused it. In another play, and he gave it to his friend Richard Leverage, who was a kind of playwright and songwriter. And he turned it. Into, he found a catchier tune for it. And the, by about the middle of the 18th century, there was a fashion for audiences to sing it before and after other plays. So you went to the theatre to see some other play, and everyone's singing wow. about roast beef. But presumably not before operas. Well, no, I think a very different audience. Yeah, different. I crowd. think there. You know, you're there with you know the Duke of Newcastle, and you're looking forward to his French cook serving you up some uh, <laughs> oh, some dainties. Yes. So you're not part of the roast beef crowd. But Tom, if you really want to sing that, do you know where it will be sung? At yeah. a formal mess dinner of His Majesty's Royal Navy today. Wow. They have the roast beef of old England, the Royal Artillery at their dinners, at formal dinners of the United States Marine Corps. Goodness. And of the Canadian they sing, they Armed sing Forces, the roast beef of England. Of old they use the tune. I don't think they do the words. I was going to say that would be odd. Piped, I think they are maybe piped into the dinner, or something. So it's basically the tune, and the sort of the the ethos, I suppose, it has endured across the world in armed forces that were once related to to, to, to Britain, yeah. basically. So, and this is the name of the famous painting. The Hogarth paints. The Hogarth painting, uh, which we should come to, because Hogarth is a member of a club. So what the actors do, so people like people who are associated with fielding, people of that kind of disposition, they start to set up from about 1705 beefsteak clubs. The first one was associated with the Drury Lane Theatre. Um, there was an actor called Richard Escort, who was kind of the master of ceremonies, and he wore a little badge with a kind of gold gridiron or grill around his neck to show his fondness for roast beef. And the most famous one of these was set up in 1735 called the Sublime Society of Beefsteaks. So you mentioned Hogarth. Hogarth was a member, the, the, the great British painter and engraver. John Wilkes, the, um, the sort of radical mm -hmm. gadfly, parliamentary gadfly, he was a member. Dr. Johnson was a member. Um, another associate of the show, uh, future fat king, George IV. He was also a member, and they would meet above the Covent Garden Theatre. They would wear a special blue coat. You said about their waistcoat, special waistcoat with brass buttons that said had Beef and Liberty written on, and they would wear a badge, um, a sort of silver medal of the gridiron, and again, Beef and Liberty. So there you have the association between Liberty, which is a great watchword against Catholic France, and beef eating. And obviously what you would eat if you were a vegetarian, this was, I mean, Tom, you would not be welcome at this club. You had to go and you had to eat beef, mustard and horseradish and baked potatoes. Interestingly, they would have it with baked potatoes. Not chips. I don't think there's any chips. No. The Beefsteak Club lasted for about another 130 years. So it was actually was wound up in 1867, by which time, you know, the idea of Beefsteak Clubs is incredibly unfashionable. But we mentioned Hogarth. Um you could argue that beef is personal for Hogarth because he'd grown up in a Smithfield market. Yeah, he's baptised in St. Bartholomew the Great. So there you go. Yeah, um, we saw it. So for people who don't know, his career flourishes between the 1730s and the 1750s. I always think, do you, I mean, Tom, I know you love Dickens. Do you think Hogarth is a bit of a forerunner of Dickens, the same kind of kind of character and colour and love of London? He's a kind of Dr. Johnson as a pit bull. Yeah. I guess would be the way to describe it. He's more him. spiky than Dr. Johnson, yeah, he isn't is. he? Yeah, he is. He is. There's a kind of aggression to Hogarth and a sort of slight element of 
a, a misanthropy, would you say? Yeah, I think so to a degree. Yes, he if he was a cart- political cartoonist, I think it's fair to say he'd probably be writing, he'd be doing his work for one of the more feral Daily British Express. newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned him doing a, the roast beef of Old England. So the original painting was called The Gate of Calais, and he'd actually been arrested as a spy in Calais while sketching it. And, he'd and shown, he shows himself, doesn't he, in the painting, yes, doing a sketch. exactly. And he'd actually shown sketches to the French to say, look, I am actually a painter. I'm not here spying. And it, you can look it up online. Um, you can Google it. Basically, the scene is at the Gate of Calais, and it shows a huge side of beef being transported from the harbour to an English-owned tavern, while a group of sort of ragged, half-skeletal, sinister-looking French soldiers and a very fat French Catholic friar <laughs> Look at this beef, <laughs> it's sort of <laughs> slavering, you know, a great envy. Yeah. And um, this was turned into a best selling print and renamed Oh, the Roast Beef of Old England. And one of his friends at the Beef State Club, a guy called Theodosius Forrest, he'd written the club anthem of the Beef State Club, which I'll come to later. And he wrote a cantata based on Hogarth's painting, uh, which was performed at the Haymarket Theatre. And to give you a sense of the sensitivity of the cantata, there's a French soldier who is given the following lines, and they are written in kind of cod franglais. So the French soldier <laughs> says, A sacre Dieu, what do I see yonder? That looks tempting, red and white. Begar, I see the roast beef from Londres. Oh, grant me one little bite. So it's literally written in this appalling. Um, uh, then he does another, um, so you said about frogs. Hogarth did another picture uh, about 10 years later called The Invasion. So this is during the Seven Years' War, and there are, as usual, invasion fears. And in that, it's a group of French preparing to embark for England, and they are roasting frogs <laughs> over a fire to oh, snack like Dr. on. Dr. Valverde. Very like Dr. Valverde from the Costa Rican podcast, for which, Tom, you've, I believe, promised to do a charity benefit in, in, uh, <laughs> to benefit Dr. Valverde's family, having yes, maligned them so cruelly. Yes, do I listen have. to that podcast if you want to find out what Tom did so disgracefully. Um, so so in the invasion, the, the, the French are roasting um, frogs. And this time, another of Hogarth's friends and sort of beefsteak eating chums, who's a guy called David Garrick, great mm. actor, um, whose theatre and club still stand in London. He wrote an accompanying caption. With lantern jaws and croaking gut, see how the half-starved Frenchmen strut and call us English dogs. But soon we'll teach these bragging foes that beef and beer give heavier blows than soup and roasted frogs. So this is very much the thing. And I think there's, a, there's an element of self-parody beginning to creep in here. So by the 1760s, so the peak of this stuff, I would say, is probably, I don't know, 1740s, 50s. By the 1760s, it's slightly becoming a caricature that people are living up to. So, Tom, I know you love Johnson and Boswell. Um, so Dr. Johnson, the great lexicographer and critic, James Boswell, his Scottish biographer. Boswell came to London in 1762. And in December, he deliberately does his best to live up to this because he writes in his journal, uh, the enemies of the people of England who would have them considered in the worst light represent them as selfish beef eaters and cruel. In this view, I resolved today <laughs> to be a true born old Englishman. I went to the city to Dolly's Steakhouse in Paternoster Row, and I swallowed my dinner by myself to fulfill the charge of selfishness. I had a large fat beef steak to fulfill the charge of beef eating, and then I went at five o'clock to the Royal Cockpit in St. James's Park, and I saw cockfighting for about five hours to fulfill the charge of cruelty. That is very English behaviour. It is very English behaviour. Well, it's yeah, but the sta- staggering thing about that, actually, now that I, I only noticed it when I read it out, he watched the cockfighting for five hours. For five hours, yeah. That's a long... That's yeah, like, it's almost like going to cricket. <laughs> yeah, five days. <laughs> so by that point, it's become a bit of a caricature, I think, that people are living up to. It's in the 1760s that you get the... So first of all, you get the character of the Englishman as a butcher. You see this in print. So it'll be a butcher accompanied by his bulldog or his mastiff. It's like going back all the way to Henry V, talk of mastiffs there. And then what takes over from the butcher is John Bull. So John Bull had been created in 1712 by, again, a Scottish writer, actually, called John Arthbuthnot, kind of teasing the English. But he really peaks between 1760s and the end of the century, especially during the French Revolution. 
he's a fat man, as you said, Tom, is stout. He's in his waistcoat. He's often shown with a, 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 some, a tankard of beer in his hand, uh, eating a pudding or <laughs> eating a beefsteak or something like this. He's, he's bluff. He's skeptical. He's, he's anti-intellectual. You. He's, yeah, thanks. To, he's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, you get the peak of John Bull. And that's really during the French Revolution when he is juxtaposed with skinny, enthusiastic, idealistic, cruel, rationalist, atheistical yeah. kind of Jacobins. And you get the, the very, very famous quote from Edmund Burke, don't you, about the uh, metropolitan, the chattering classes. That's right, but, yeah. Because half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink, while thousands of great cattle reposed beneath the shadow of the British oak chew the card and are silent. Pray do not imagine that those who make the noise are the only inhabitants of the field. There you and go. that's that a kind of recalibration of the whole yeah, absolutely. theme, isn't it? It is, absolutely. But John Bull is kind of the last flowering of this, because by that point, the kind of beef stuff has become a little bit it's not just that it's a joke it's become yesterday's theme so i think that with the end of the french revolutionary wars with the end of the napoleonic wars in 1815 then the sort of all the stuff about beef and liberty sort of all those people are dead now hogarth garrick you know all those characters dr johnson they are absolutely yesterday's news um the industrial revolution means that britain is becoming much more urban so the the invocation of the kind of rural, I mean, now actually in the Victorian period, when rural squires and stuff appear in 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 fiction and popular culture, they are they are not the soul of the nation. They are just ludicrous backward figures who are being superseded by railways and industrialists yeah. and businessmen. Lord Dedlock, exactly. Yes, actually, that's exactly right. Celeste Dedlock in Bleak House is a perfect. He's somebody who a hundred years earlier would have been Squire Weston, wouldn't he? Yeah. In kind of Tom Jones. And now it's and that, always raining and miserable. And exactly. Lady Deadlock goes rushing off to London. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Um, but also, of course, the French threat has kind of gone with the uh, aftermath of Waterloo. You know, there's, there, is a, there is a degree of sort of, sort of performative anti Frenchness left, I suppose. But by and large, you know, that battle is won. And so the threat of French invasion and of frog eating or whatever, and of, and of people sort of dodgy stocks and sources has abated um and the sort of the roast beef of old england stuff just feels old fashioned but where i think it so it does live on a little bit um it lives on if you do you know the restaurant chain i mean you'd be ill advised to visit it tom given your proclivities hawksmoor in london no you don't you've never been to a hawksmoor no they are excellent restaurants there's only a few of them they are they basically specialize in steaks and um their That's logo I don't, I is, mean to them. is beef and liberty. So they reproduce. Okay. Do they the, serve anything else apart from beef? Yeah, they serve seafood. They serve Dover sole. Um, they might do stuffed mushrooms or something, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested. The other places where I think this lives on. Now, you can tell me whether you think this is completely spurious and mad. Obviously, Ben Rogers called um, the early modern English the Texans of the early modern world. There is a definite sense, isn't there, in America, like tex the idea of the Texan with his massive steak. I wonder if that's yeah, a, a, a slight derivation because that's also associated with it's very American, very patriotic, very kind of macho, manly, red-blooded. I'm going to have a massive steak in a Texan steakhouse. I wonder whether there's a slight element there of the food having, the sort of yeah, meat bit. eating having a kind of political a meaning. Bit. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you uh, somebody who is the embodiment of this spirit is uh, Ian Botham, whose nickname is Beefy. Yeah. Uh, and who's absolutely. kind of paradigmatic John Bull figure. He is, absolutely. So Ian Botham is a English cricketer who was probably the most famous cricketer in the world in the 80s for our American and non-cricket playing listeners. Yeah. Australians will or, or have recognised him immediately and be, <laughs> be laughing with joy at the mention of Sir Ian Botham. Or Lord Botham. Is Lord he Lord Botham, Botham now, Tom? Lord Botham of beef. Lord Botham of Brexit, I think people call him, don't they? Because he's yeah. a very outspoken Brexit. They sometimes call him Lord Botham of beef. They do. They do, absolutely. Well, I wrote about this in um, I know you did. Who Dares Wins, my book about the early 80s. And I, I, it struck me at the time, Botham is such a kind of 18th century figure, yeah. smiting foreigners, eating beef, behaving yeah. badly, yeah. slightly issues with his weight, yeah. you know, um, all of that sort of stuff. So Botham beating the Australians raises the other thing I was going to ask about, whether you think – now, you will, I'm sure, say this is completely spurious – 
whether there is a tiny hint of an association. So the way that Australians think about their barbecues, mm, you know, they're quite know. kind of red blooded. It's a manly thing to do. You had a beer, have a barbecue. You know, it's not fancy. There's a simplicity and a sort of authenticity to it. No, I did because I think that's I think that's more to do with hunting. Hunting, right? Isn't it? It's the idea of the. Uh, I don't know. I've never been to Australia. You know, the outback. So oh, maybe I don't know. I w- I wouldn't have thought it's it's a direct line of descent from that. Okay. Well, I didn't think it was direct, but I was just wondering whether I because I think one of the fascinating things about food. Some people will say, "Oh, this is." Sometimes when we veer off from politics and wars. Some people say, oh, this isn't proper history. But actually, I think things like food, culture, customs, they're wonderful windows into how a society thinks. And obviously now in Britain, Tom, we we really have lost touch with that beef and liberty, haven't we? Do you think those days will ever return? Well, as as we said at the beginning, I think the, um, the mad cow disease was emblematic of something being rotten in the state of England because... The folk memory of beef as an emblem of England did mm. remain, which yeah. is why the site, the site of you know the thought of cows basically being fed, being made into cannibals and then mm. going mad, was such a kind of potent metaphor. Yeah, yeah, it was depressing metaphor. Well, that was actually what inspired. So I mentioned Ben Rogers' brilliant book. I'll mention it again because I've stolen so much from it. Beef and Liberty. He says that the begin- that's what inspired him to write right, the book yeah. was the reaction to the to mad cow disease. So Tom, I think we should end on an upbeat note. After I mean. For all we know, so we don't know when we're when we're recording this, and we don't know whether England have crashed out of the World Cup. They've begun well. They, um, they've we've only seen one match, two. haven't we? That's the so I don't know whether it. us mentioning that match will now have a poignantly <laughs> ironic ring, or whether that was the first step on the road to glory. Nobody knows. But I think we shall end with the anthem of the Sublime Society of Beef Steaks. I won't sing it. You'll be pleased to hear. If you want music, go to the Uruguay podcast and the beautiful Tupamaros theme. Or indeed the uh, Tunisian one. Yeah, for Tom's opera. Yeah. But this is the Sublime Society of Beefsteaks, their club song. No more shall fame expand her wings to sound of heroes, states and wings. A nobler flight the goddess takes to praise our British beef in steaks. A joyful theme for Britons free, happy in beef and liberty. Throughout the realm where despots reign, what tracks of glory now remain? Their people, slaves of power and pride, fat beef and freedom are denied. What realm, what state can happy be, wanting our beef and liberty? Goodbye. Goodbye.